matters to me The only one whose favor I see The only me that matters to me Yes, will be The friendship and affection I need To feel my father smiling on me The only me that matters to me Case Cooper a hand this morning. He came up here and helped me with my first song. And go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Sing it again. Go Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Shepherds were out watching, silent flocks by night. Yeah. 
Savior's birth. We're singing, go tell it. Before the Holy One of Heaven. You know, there's a spiritual truth that no mortal man would dare to stand in front of absolute God, Almighty God. So how will we be able to do that? The blood of Christ. Today we begin, or continue, excuse me, we continue our four-part series about this holy day, not a holiday, a holy day called Christmas. I came, I saw, I conquered, Julius Caesar said in 46 B.C. 46 years before Jesus is born in Bethlehem, there is a king and there is a kingdom and there is an emperor, his name is Julius Caesar. He said those words after he made a swift victory, bragging about himself. I came, I saw, I conquered. But we're not going to talk about Julius Caesar today or during this series, and here's why. Because he's dead and he's not coming back. But what if I told you that there is one that did come and he did see and he did conquer, and he's still alive, and he's coming back? You'd want to pay attention to that one. We're going to spend four weeks looking at one who really came. He really saw, he really conquered, what? Death itself. To answer the question, no mortal man would dare to stand before your throne. Unless God had a plan to turn mortal man into children of God. And children will stand before his throne. His children will stand before his throne before the Holy One of Heaven. I plan to add a fourth column to the story, He Reigns. You see, Julius Caesar couldn't pull that off, not for any length of time anyway. He came, he saw, he conquered, he died, and he stayed dead. But there's one who came, who saw, who conquered, and he reigns now and forevermore. 
Four weeks of Jesus. I'm convinced you can't get enough of that word, Jesus. Four weeks of Jesus. Last week, I hope you were here because we kind of laid a foundation about why and how he came. Today, we'll review what he saw. Beside me is a screen that illustrates, illustrates he saw. When God became a man, he came to the earth and he saw something. He saw a series of things we're going to talk about today. If the Lord is willing, next week we'll review who and what he conquered. You need to know who and what he conquered. And finally, the grand finale will come on Christmas week when we will review what, who, and how he will reign. He came. The whole point of Christmas is undeniable. He came. If you ever wonder why some people, unbelievers, hate Christmas so much, they want to call it happy holidays. I was on the phone this week and some lady, some business that we were dealing with in the church, and she said happy holiday at the end of the conversation. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> She's probably thinking you're one of those. Yeah, I'm one of those. Yeah, let me tell you about Christmas. Let me tell you about Christ. You ever wonder why there are people that just, they hate manger scenes in public squares and Christmas this and Christmas that because he came. And mangers in public squares and Christmas songs and school plays with a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger all bring this two words in front of them that they have already rejected, he came. Let's see, they reject the idea that he came, that God came. And every time we bring it back up, it forces them to deal with it again, and they don't like dealing with it. But he came. God came to the earth in human flesh. He came. Who came? God came. Emmanuel. What do you think Emmanuel means? God with us. I am came. Creator came. You will never understand the significance of that first Christmas until you understand the events that lead up to the first Christmas. He came. That first Christmas, He came. But my question today is, after He came, He saw. What did He see? When God became a man, what did He see through those human eyes? And I want you to get this first point today. If God became flesh, that means He put Himself inside human flesh, that what came upon Mary was the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. She became pregnant with the Son of God. And He came in human flesh with human eyes. But what did the human flesh and human eyes experience? What did He see? He saw. And the question today is, the foundation that we'll build upon today is, why did he come in human flesh? Why didn't he just come in glory and splendor? Why did he come in human flesh? You'll need to know this, so we start with this foundation. He came and he saw. What did he see through human eyes? First, let me explain why he had human eyes. It's found in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It says, because God's children are human beings. That's us. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. Why did He come with human eyes? Why did He pour Himself in human flesh? Because that's who we are. Let me read it again. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could He die. Only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary. I want you to get the phrase. 
Therefore, it was necessary, what? For him to be made in every respect like us. It was necessary to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters. Why? So that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then, then, he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Only then, only then, only after becoming human, only after becoming human and then dying, could he offer a sacrifice for humans that would satisfy the judgment of God. God didn't become, God didn't become a man to help angels. Did you catch that? He didn't come to the earth in human flesh to help angels. He came specifically, I want you to get this first, to help the descendants of Abraham. It clearly says he came to help the descendants of Abraham. He came to, pray, to break the power of the devil, the power of death, the curse. If you were here last week, I told you that the power of the devil, the curse, was to Adam, you will return to the dust from which you came. And what is a picture of dust? The picture of dust is what happens to human flesh after death. It is a picture of the grave itself. He came. In John chapter 1, verse 10, he came. He came into the very world he created. He, who created it? He did. He came into the very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people. He didn't come to help angels, did he? Not initially. He came to help the children of Abraham. He came to his own people, and even they, the Jewish people, they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to be called the children of God. What mortal man would dare to stand before his throne? I'm going to ask you a question. What mortal man would ever dare to stand before his throne? There's only one answer. That'd be his children. His children will stand before his throne. Did you catch this? But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the Word became human. Now, you've got to get this before we go. Here we go. The Word became human. What the Word? Notice a capital W. No matter which translation, you're going to find the same thing. It is a reference to deity itself. <clears throat> so when you see a capital W in this reference translated to English, it's a reference to deity God became human. And you know through reading the rest of the scriptures that the word has a name. It's not just Bible. The word has a name. His name is Jesus. So today when I read this verse, I want you to understand. Read verse 14. So the word became human and made his home among us. He came. The word came. You know, the Bible says that there are only six, less than 600 people that actually saw Jesus resurrected with their own eyes. Less than 600 people. Less than 600 people saw him with their eyes. But you have saw him. You have seen him. The Word became human and made his home among us and he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen His glory. The glory of the Father's one and only Son. Some of the other translations say the Word became flesh. The Word became human, but He came. And we have seen His glory. Well, well wait a minute. How have we seen His glory? Today when we came out, we were saying that though I have not seen him, I love him. And even though I have not, cannot see him now, I believe in him. Less than 600 people witnessed the resurrected Christ. And we stand here today or sit here today and we say, we've seen his glory. Have you? Can you see? The one and only son, have you seen him? Have you met him? I'm asking a question. Have you seen him? Have you met him? 
The Word became flesh and He dwelt among us and we've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Have you seen Him? Have you met Him? Verse 10, He came into the very world He created. But the world didn't recognize him. You know what the word recognize says? It couldn't see him. He came so that man could see the glory of God. But many didn't see him, didn't recognize him at all. You see, this was the problem throughout the 33 years of Jesus' life on the planet that he created. They didn't recognize who he was. They couldn't see the glory. He came and revealed the glory of the Father. But many looked at the glory and said, I don't see glory. I see a man. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells his disciples that he will soon go and prepare a place for them. And then he says, and then I'll return. And then he says that they all know the way to where he is going. Now let me set this up. Because there's two people inside John chapter 14 I want you to uh, focus on. He calls all of his disciples together and says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and get you so that you will be where I am forever. And you all know the way, okay? And he looks at them with this assumption, you all know me, so you all know the way, right? Right, right. So everybody says, okay, right? No, they don't say that at all. In fact, the very next sentence says, John 14, 5. He's just said, you know the way, right? You know me, so you know the way. Verse 5, no, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. In fact, we have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus has just said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. I'm leaving, but I'll be back to get you, and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas is like, no, I don't know the way. No, I don't. Lord, I do not know the way. You see, this was the whole problem. How can I know the way? How how can I know the way? And Jesus must have had some frustration at this point because they hadn't just met. They've spent time together and they've watched the miracles. They've seen the glory. And yet Thomas says, so how can we know the way? And what's Jesus say? Verse 6. Listen, verse 6. Most of you know verse 6. Maybe you don't know verse 6 in the context, but you know verse 6. And Jesus says, I am the way. And I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. And he says in verse 7, if you had really known me, Thomas, if you really known me, you would know who my Father is. And from now on, you do know him. And here he comes. Are you ready? Say, "Uh uh-huh. And from now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Can you see? If you don't understand the context, you're going to miss it. Jesus says, I am going to leave and prepare a place for you. And after I leave and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and get you. We'll be together forever. And you know the way to where I'm going. You know the way. And Thomas says, no, I don't. I don't have any idea. I don't know where you're going. don't know how to get there. And Jesus says, I am the way, Thomas. I'm the truth. I'm the life. It's me. If you know me, you know the way. Because I am the way. And then he says this. If you had really known me, verse 7, you would know who my father is. And from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Even after all this time, they still weren't getting it. God in the flesh. The word became human. The creator, Emmanuel. I am. Can't you see? If you've seen me, you've met God. If you've seen me, you've seen God. Only God could do the things you saw me do. Believe because you have seen. Now notice in John 14, 6, there's a second character. That's Thomas. What we were just reading is Thomas. But there's a second guy. His name's Philip. I wonder, can he see? Thomas can't see. Thomas, he's not in denial. He admits, Lord, I don't know the way. I don't know how to get there. I'm not getting it. Okay, I'm slow. I'm not getting it. 
And then here comes Philip. The very next verse, what, what's Jesus just said? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? From now on, you know Father because you know me, right? And at that point, surely, 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 Philip gets it, right? Next verse, very next verse, verse 8. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. If you imagine Jesus standing there at this point thinking, what am I going to do with these guys? And the reason I say, listen. There are people in this room today, just like Philip and just like Thomas, right here, in this room right now. You still don't know who he is. I'm going to prove it to you. You still don't know who he is. Philip says this, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Jesus replied, verse 9, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe. Wow. Two words. Just believe. Believe what? That I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. Here are two guys that have spent an enormous amount of time walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, seeing the miracles of Jesus, experiencing Jesus. And Thomas says, no, we don't know the way, Lord. Philip says, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. They can't see the way because they can't see. Listen, they can't see the way because what? They can't see him. Not for who he is. Oh, they see him. They see a teacher. They see a good man. But they don't see him. Not for who he really is. Not yet. Not yet. Can you see? He came and he saw The first two points of this Christmas series are he came and he saw, and I'm going to give you the teaser. Here's the teaser. I'll tell you later, but I want you to think about it. What did he see? When he came, when God put himself inside human flesh and gave Jesus human eyes, what did he see? Can you see? Can you see now? Can you see today? What did he see? Because I'm going to tell you, when I read the scripture, I see clearly that he came and I see clearly that he saw But what was it that he saw? Because I'm going to tell you, you need to know what he saw. Because that's why he came. What about Philip and what about Thomas? Well, you know what? I don't know a whole lot about Philip immediately in this context. I know about Philip, but not in this context. But Thomas, we have an eye opener. What about after? You see, this is before the death and the burial and the resurrection. What about Thomas after the death and the burial and the resurrection? Could he see then? Because he's not seeing before, right? He says, Lord, I don't know the way. I, I, I don't know. I'm not getting it. But what about after? Did he get it? John 20, verse 24. This is after. One of the disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. Now, this is when Jesus resurrected. Jesus came and appeared, showed himself. Thomas was not with the others when he came. And they told him, that, don't miss this. So I want you to picture this scene. I like to visualize stuff. I picture all of these guys together, and Jesus comes and reveals his glory to them, and he blows their socks off. They're amazed. But Thomas is absent that day for some reason, right? So now, after they've seen him, Jesus has left again and departed. And now these guys, all these believers, come to Thomas in verse 25. They told him, we've seen the Lord. Can can I infer something here? I'm going to tell you what they just told him. We saw God. We didn't see a teacher. We saw God. You see, they're getting it. But Thomas still hasn't got it. But they're getting it. They said, we've seen the Lord. But he, Thomas, because he wasn't there, He said, I won't believe unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. 
I won't believe unless I put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound of his side. Well, eight days later, he's going to get a chance to do that. Eight days later, the disciples were gathered together, and this time Thomas was with them. Do you think Thomas was ac uh, accidentally gone the first time? God doesn't do accidents. Eight days later, Thomas happens to be there. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he said to Thomas, it's recorded. He looks at Thomas. Everybody else has seen God, but Thomas hasn't seen God. Thomas still doesn't know the way. You know why he doesn't know the way? Because he doesn't see Jesus for who Jesus really is. Not yet, but he's about to. Then he looked at Thomas, and he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound on my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. And what did Thomas say? Some of you are smiling because you're getting it. And what did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. What did Thomas just call Jesus? God. Thomas can see. Now, i got to tell you, Thomas can see because Thomas saw. But what if you didn't see? Would you be able to see? Thomas can see, but listen to Jesus' response. Now, suddenly, Thomas has experienced enlightenment. He's not just calling him Lord, which is, means master. Now, I believe for the first time in Thomas' life, he sees Jesus as Jesus really is. God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen this glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He sees Jesus not just as, wow, walking on water, Jesus. Wow, good teacher, Jesus. Wow, you can do amazing things, Jesus. He sees Jesus as my Lord and my God. Now, what's Jesus going to say? Here we go. John 20, verse 29. Jesus looks at him and says, you believe, Thomas, because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Did you know you're blessed? If you're in the room today and you know Jesus is God, then you are blessed. Because though I have not seen him, I love him. And even though I cannot see him now, I believe in him. And I'm filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For I am receiving the goal of my faith, the salvation of my soul. The Bible says, the Apostle Paul reveals to the church in Corinth that it's less than 600 people who had the opportunity and privilege to see the resurrected Christ. Paul, Thomas was one of those fortunate ones. And because he saw, he believed. But what about the world that would follow? I wonder how the world that will follow Thomas will ever be able to know he's God. How will the world that follows Thomas, only 600 people on the planet got to see the resurrected Christ. I wonder how the world to follow will ever get to know who he is. I wonder how they'll do that. You see, when I read this, verse 29, Jesus says, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. There's a lot of seeing going on in that scene. Do you see? Can you recognize him? He came, he saw, because Jesus came and he saw what? Can you see? Thomas can see after he saw Jesus. Can you see? You see, shortly after that event with Thomas, he ascended. Jesus ascended, and I suppose no one has physically seen him since. The only one I can think of for sure that's recorded is the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. I don't know of anybody else. Maybe there was, but I don't know of anybody else who has physically seen him. One of my favorite Bible verses, I've said it I think three times, I'm going to go for number four. It is this, and, and maybe for the first time you'll understand why Peter says this. He says, though I have not seen him. You know, there was a time after the 
death, burial, and resurrection that Peter had to not go by sight. He had to go by faith. And though I have not seen him, you see, when Peter writes this, he's talking to me and you. You see, Peter had an opportunity to see with his own eyes, and so did Thomas and Andrew and James and John. But he knew that there'd be a whole generation of people that would follow all the way up to this day right here, that people would have to believe him because of something, because of sight. So Peter writes it down, and then what's he write down? Though you have not seen him, you believe in him. And even though you cannot, you love him, and even though you cannot see him right now, this moment, you believe in him. And you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy because you're re receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. All of that, everything I've said so far is to get to the main point today. He came and he saw. God came and God saw. What did he see when he came? Through those human eyes, what did he see? Here we go. Are you ready to say, uh-huh? He saw that they still couldn't see. When he came, he saw that they couldn't see. They were blind. Why can't they see him? The Apostle Paul reveals the source of this spiritual blindness. Let there be no mistake. Why can't they see? Why, why, do we, why do you and I live among a people that cannot see? Why? 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, let there be no mistake. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see. I want you to look at what I'm doing right now. They are unable to see what? What, what could make you blind? They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. I am holding in front of you the glorious light of the good news. It's called the Word. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. And if you can't see the glorious light of the good news, and you're, you weren't one of those 600 people that saw the resurrected Christ, then you're blind. Because there's only two ways that you're going to be able to see, have eyes to see. You either saw him in resurrection, you knew him personally, experienced him personally, but quite frankly, that number is pretty small after the cross. And Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. How would you not believe? Either you've been exposed to this and didn't receive it and believe it, or you never were exposed to this and thus you're just blind. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ. What, what is the message about the glorious, glorious Christ? L listen, don't miss it. Who is the exact likeness of God. He's God. That's why he came. I, I told you last week he came to stomp the serpent's head and to stop him from blinding people. That's why he came. But what did he see? He, he saw that they have eyes, but they cannot see the glorious light of the good news. Let me give you an example of something that Jesus saw. And then he had it recorded so that you and I would see it. It's found in Matthew 18, 8, 18 and it begins with when Jesus saw. So I know that he saw this scene unfolding. It says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. Then one of the teachers of religious law, meet the first guy, a teacher of the religious law, okay? When one of the teachers of the religious law saw Jesus, he said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. I wonder if you think the teacher of religious law, do you think he can see? He's being nice. He says, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you will go. But Jesus answered or replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. Does that seem like an odd answer to that statement? A teacher of the religious law looks at Jesus and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus starts talking about foxes. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man, he doesn't have any place to lay his head. 
Well, that's the first guy. Let's look at the second guy. There's another guy. Another of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. And Jesus told him, follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury the dead. Jesus saw when God became flesh and dwelt among us, he had human eyes and he saw that they couldn't see. See what? That they were seeing God. They weren't just seeing a teacher. They were seeing God. Let me, let me show you this in modern text. Many today see Jesus as a good teacher. Many today see Jesus as a teacher. Did you know the teacher of the religious law? What title did he use to refer to Jesus? Teacher. Many today see Jesus as a good teacher. Do you know that Islam sees Jesus as a good teacher? Do you know that in the Quran it mentions Jesus multiple times as a good teacher? But you know what? They don't see Jesus for who he really is. He's God. In fact, Islam teaches that he's a good teacher and one day he'll come back. You know, Islam teaches that Jesus is coming back. But the difference is they believe that Jesus is coming back to subject himself to the Muslim Mahdi, the Messiah, and tell all the Christians of the world to convert to Islam. That's what they believe. You see, they see Jesus as a good teacher, but they don't see Jesus as God. Thus, they don't see Jesus. And maybe you're in the room today and you know, well, I'm not a Muslim. I, I see him as a good teacher. No, that's not my point. Do you see him for who he really is? Is he God? You see, the problem with Philip and Thomas and was that they couldn't see him for who he really was. You know, Thomas says, I don't know the way. And Jesus says, if you know me, you know the way. Don't you know who I am? And then Philip says, show us the Father. And well, you've seen the Father. You don't know who I am. You have not seen me. Your eyes are blinded. You're not seeing me. The God of this world is blinding the eyes of those who cannot see. It's preventing them from seeing the glorious gospel. What? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only. It came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you see? Do you believe? Do you really see Him for who He really is? Is He God? You see, Jesus saw the crowd and he knew that the crowd didn't really see him. Not as he really was, God in the flesh, the Word become human, Creator, Emmanuel, I am. Let me say this, if you're in the room today, let me, let me prove it to you, I'm going to give you a practical application. If you're in the room today, let me hold this up, if you're in the room today and two words, follow me, follow me, if you're struggling with that, there's only one reason, I'm going to tell you the truth, you still don't know who he is. You still don't know who he is. If the follow me part of Christianity you're struggling with, you still really don't know who he is. Let me prove it to you. Okay? Some of you give me that look. One guy, the teacher of the religious law, looks at Jesus. He was our first example. And he said what? He said, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. I'm going to ask you a question. He says, teacher, He's looking at Jesus. Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. Would he have said that to Jesus had he saw Jesus as God? Some of you would think, well, I'm not sure. Well, what's Jesus' answer? Because Jesus knows what's going on in this guy's mind. And what is his answer? Doesn't it look a little out of place? Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I'm all, so let me put the question in a way that makes sense now. Would you follow me into poverty if you thought I was just a teacher? Would you forsake your position in wealth if all you saw me as a teacher? If all you see me as, as a teacher, and thanks for calling me teacher, that word means rabbi, but would you abandon everything to follow me? Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't even have a house to lay his head. Would you follow me into absolute worldly homelessness? Let, let me, you would if you thought he was God. But you wouldn't if you thought he was just a teacher. 
And there's the difference. Do you know who he is? If you're today in this room and you're struggling with those two words, follow me. I wonder, have you really ever seen who he really is? If God walked up to you, you're out in the middle of some, just you and him, in the glorious, powerful, almighty, omniscient, ob powerful God appeared to you in his glory and he said, follow me. Would you? See, if you saw him as God, you know, and I know, you'd say, yeah, I'm going to follow him. And yet people today, even in the church, are having a hard time following Jesus. Are you really seeing who he is? You see, Thomas and Philip saw Jesus as a good teacher, but they didn't know that the way to the Father. Why? Notice Jesus' response. Is Jesus trying to talk the guy out of it, or is Jesus trying to show the guy how to see? Foxes have dens. If you don't get this, you're thinking, that is the craziest answer I've ever heard to a, I'll follow you anywhere. Foxes have dens. Birds have nests. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Would you follow me into homelessness, at least homelessness on this earth? Would you forsake everything to follow me? Because you just said you'd follow me, but you called me teacher. Will you follow God? Where is home anyway? You see, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So where is his home? Where are you from, Jesus? Do you think it matters where he's from? If you're going to know who he is. In John 6, 38, it says this. Jesus is, is talking himself. He says, for I have come down from heaven. Okay? Well, you're from heaven. Now, if, somebody, if I leave the, this room today and I go out in the lobby and somebody says, I have come down from heaven, immediately they've got my attention. Okay? Why? Because that's kind of unusual. Jesus is looking at a crowd of people, and he says, I have come down from heaven to do the will of God. Now, don't, don't miss the part. He starts by saying, I've come down from heaven. I'm not from here. I've come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who what? All who what? See. Can you see? It's my Father's will that all who see His Son and believe in Him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. And you think everybody's going to say, you've come from heaven so that we can see. No, you know what they're doing? They're murmuring. Why? Because the one telling them that He came from heaven, they don't see Him for who He is. They think, well, let me read it to you. It says this, the people began to murmur in disagreement because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? Do you think they see him for who he is? Isn't that Joseph's boy? Did you hear Joseph's boy said he came from heaven? We don't believe Joseph's boy came from heaven, so they don't see who he is. Jesus saw. He saw that they couldn't see. They didn't know they were talking to God, and thus they couldn't see why he came. Can you see the reason he came? He said, I came into the world to testify to truth. He even told the Roman governor Pilate, a Gentile, why he came. He's even telling Gentiles. Well, the Jewish people, they murmur after he says, I came down from heaven. Aren't you Joseph's boy? So he's over at Pilate right before the crucifixion, and he tells Pilate why he came. I wonder if Pilate believes him. In John 18, 37, Pilate said, so you are a king? Jesus responded, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. And all who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. Do you believe him? Then you know the truth. The truth has set you free and it gave you eyes to see. So let me ask you in another way. 
do you believe him? Then you know the truth, and the truth has set you free. Everything that I've told you today all came out of this book. I didn't make any of it up. It all came out of this book. Do you see? Because by seeing, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There was a second man in Matthew 8. Did you notice him? The first guy was a teacher of the religious law, and he says, I'll follow you wherever you go, and Jesus starts talking about foxes have dens. And if you were unable to get the first one, you're more than likely going to really struggle with the second one. Because the second man in Matthew 8, here's what he says. Well, let me just put them together, verse 18. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. Then one of the teachers of the religious law said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in, birds have nests. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Here comes guy number two. And another one of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. Let me go home and bury my father. Does that sound unreasonable? <laughs> Jesus told him, follow me now. Now, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Jesus saw that they couldn't see. See what? Is it wrong to take time to bury your father? In all likelihood, this man's father had not yet died. He was wanting to be around for the last days of his father. But either way, whether it's to go to the father's funeral, there's conjecture either way. I don't need to get into conjecture to make the point. Whether his father's about to die, will die, or has died makes no difference to this story. Let me rephrase the question. Would you ask that question if you were standing in the presence of God and he said, follow me? That's the question. If God appeared to you in all of his glory and splendor and said, follow me now, would you say, I've got some things I need to take care of at the house? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't laugh. It's my father. My father reserves reverence. No, listen, you're still not looking at who's talking to you. Follow me now. I'll tell you what you'd do. You'd follow him. Because in that moment, you'd know who he is. And if you knew it was God that said, follow me, I'll tell you what you'd do. You'd follow him. Don't you tell me you wouldn't, because I don't believe you. If you knew it was God saying, follow me, and the voice of God told you to follow him, you would follow him. And I'm asking you a question. If you today are struggling with the whole follow me part of Christianity, do you really know who he is? You see, Jesus came and he saw and he saw they couldn't see. Can you see? See what? Ultimately, when I read that story about the guy saying, let me return home and bury my father, Jesus' answer, I'm going to give you a rough paraphrase of how I read it. He says, listen, buddy, the truth is you're all going to die if you don't see. Somebody's going to have to bury every one of you all if you don't see. Because until you're able to see, every one of you is going to die. Can you see? That's why he came. Try this one. If you've struggled with the first one or the second one, let's go to Luke 14, 25. This isn't going to blow your head off. Here we go. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned and he said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father, your mother, your wife and children, your brother and sister. I had somebody one time, I was reading this too, and they said, finally, for the first time in my life, I understand why I came out of a dysfunctional family. This is easy for me. I don't think that's what he's talking about. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers and sisters, even your own life. Do you read this and think, wow, I need to hate everybody. I can do this. You think that's what he's saying? No. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Do you see what he's doing? Can you see? Do you know who he is? Are you struggling with the follow me part? What? He's saying, if God came to you and revealed himself to you, would your children 
be ahead of him? Would your wife be ahead of him? Would your husband be ahead of him? See, God's God. God's God. No mortal man will dare to stand before his throne. But I'll tell you who will stand before his throne. Listen, his children. And he's inviting you and I to see so that we would become his children. And he's trying to open our eyes. To see what? What's going to happen when you, see, open it, when you open your eyes? You're going to see who he really is who came and saw. God came. God saw. So let me just ask you three questions. Do you struggle with these examples? Let me return home and bury my father. Then you still don't know who he is. You st you're still not getting it. Do you struggle with the idea that we must hate everything else by comparison? Nothing else can even compare to the glory and splendor of God. Then you still don't know who he is. Are you struggling with the idea, if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple? In, in other words, there can't be anything else that competes with him because he's God. Would you struggle with any of those if you stood in the presence of Almighty God and he looked you in the eyes with loving eyes and said, I have sent my only son to open your eyes. I poured myself inside human flesh to come open your eyes. Can you see? Do you want to see? But the reality is when Jesus came, he could see that they couldn't see. What do you see when you see Jesus? Let me ask you a question. Probably much of what you experience from an earthly father will experience what you see from a heavenly father. I get it. And when you see Jesus or when your mind thinks about who Jesus is, do you see harshness? When you read that, unless you hate your mother and father, do you see harshness? Do you see difficulty? Do you see rules and regulations? So many people, when, when you hold this thing up, I'm going to tell you what, let's be honest, come on. To the world, you hold this thing up, they see rules and regulation and harshness and haters. And, right? Is that who you see? I, mean, I don't know who you're looking at, but you're not seeing God. You're seeing a deceiver who said, stay out of the book. He came, he saw, he saw that we couldn't see. Matthew 14, 14, he saw, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and this is who he is. I'm going to tell you who he is. He saw a huge crowd stepped out of the boat, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. That's who he is. He's the God of compassion. He's the God of healing. He came, God came, God saw what do you see when you see Jesus? Do you see compassion? Do you see healing? Here's the deal. If you saw compassion and you saw healing, you'd run to him. You would not run from him. You'd run to him. Do you see God? Do you see forgiveness? My final story today is from four guys that I'm going to say I read the Bible and I think these four guys saw God. I told you the story about Philip and Thomas and for a while they couldn't see him. He's standing right in front of them. They experienced him, but they couldn't see who he really was. Not really. Today, I want, you to re I want to read a story about four guys that when I read, I can say they saw God. They didn't see a rabbi. They didn't see a teacher. They didn't see a doctor, a healer. They surely didn't see Joseph's boy. They saw God. Four guys that saw Jesus for who he really is. They understood that he came, and he came because he could see that they couldn't see and they would be lost without him. Four guys, listen, four guys that should be the very standard for the church today when it comes to helping other people see. Four guys. Are you ready to say, uh-huh? Mark 2, 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where they were staying was so packed with visitors, there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word, I got to do this. While he was preaching God's word, while he was preaching God's word. You know, we're reading the same book that he was preaching that day. He's preaching the Old Testament, explaining the Old Testament. I'm preaching out of the New Testament. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed mat, man on a mat. They couldn't bring him, the paralyzed man, to Jesus 
because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above Jesus' head. Wow. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus saw, right? Jesus came, he came, he saw. What is he seeing? I'm going to tell you what the Word says. He didn't see a dust pile coming out of the ceiling. You know what he's seeing? Four men with incredible faith. You know what he's seeing? Four men that see me for who I am. Four men that see God's down there. And that roof's not going to keep me away from him. And I'm bringing a friend to meet God. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, now, now, don't miss it, don't miss it. He is just, these four guys have just risked everything, personal injury, whatever, to let this guy down in front of Jesus. And what's Jesus going to say? You're making a mess. huh? What, what's he going to say? Of all the things he could have said, you know what he could say? You're healed. He didn't say that, does he? What's he say? Your sins are forgiven. That's why he came. That's it. When you see who he is, who he really is, for the first time, that's when you're going to hear what you need to hear. Your sins are forgiven. That's why he came. My child. Do you see what he calls him? My child. Faith makes you a child. My child, your sins are forgiven. He came. He saw. He forgives. Those four men saw God. For only God can forgive sins. They saw him. Jesus saw that they could see who he really was. And he forgave the sins of the paralyzed man. He came and he saw what we couldn't see. He saw that we were unable to see unless He comes and opens our eyes. We were blinded by sin, blinded to sin, and He came. Can you see? Do you want to see? And my last question is, do you want to? See? In Luke 10, 21, at the same time, Jesus was filled with joy of the Holy Spirit, and He said, Oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing these things to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me, Jesus said, and no one truly knows the Son except the Father. No one truly knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. We were in the early service this morning, the first service, and immediately when we offered an invitation, a, a lady came directly out of the back, and she came up and she said to me, for today, for the first time, I see. And I asked, would you baptize me? Today, her eyes opened. And look what he says. We're back to verse 22. Put it on the screen. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Himself. Has He chosen to reveal Himself to you today? Verse 23. Then when they were alone, He, Jesus, turned to His disciples and said, Blessed are the eyes that see what you have seen. I tell you, many prophets and kings have longed to see what you see, and they didn't see it. And they longed to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. He came and he saw. He saw that we couldn't see, and that's why he came. We were blinded by sin. We were blinded to sin. Can you see why he came? He came to forgive our sins. I love the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. How many sermons have been taught preached on that? And today, I close with that verse about what happened when her eyes were open to see Jesus as God. And then she turns back to her village to tear off the roof of the houses of all the blind people. You know what the church is supposed to be doing in the last days? Tearing off the roof of the houses of the blind people. Don't go out of here and start going up on the roof tearing off shingles. But that's what she does. 
Jesus reveals himself to her, and she says, she goes back into the village and says, come and see the man who has told me everything I ever did. I have met God. And she goes and tells everybody. This was the result of one woman seeing God and then escorting other people into the presence of God through Jesus Christ. John 4, 42. Picture the entire village after they have heard her story about meeting God, coming, and here's what it says, verse 42. Then they said to the woman, this is the community she lived in, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him for ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Now we believe. Is that you? Can you say for sure today, now, I believe he is the Savior of the world. He came, he saw, he saw that we couldn't see, and he specializes in opening eyes. I'm going to ask Chad to come out for the invitation. And one more time, I want you to put in perspective what Peter writes. Peter had the privilege of being one of those 600 people that met Jesus. The resurrected Christ. He saw. He experienced. He could touch his hands. He, he saw everything. He experienced everything. But he knew there would be a generation that would follow him that would be unable to see with our eyes. We would have to see by faith. By faith in what? Well, I can tell you part of it was what Peter was writing down at the time, and I'm about to read to you though I have not seen him. I love him. And even though I cannot see him now, I believe in him and I am filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for I am receiving the goal of my faith, the salvation of my soul. Is that you today? We're going to sing a song. It says something like this, light of the world, you step down into glory. Open my eyes, and let me see. Beauty that made my heart adore you hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say what Thomas said. You are my God. Today we offer this invitation of Christ for those who have had their eyes opened by the word through Christ. The invitation stands open. Let's stand. And today this is Mallory Kincaid and Mallory comes forward uh, to accept Jesus into her life as her Savior and Lord and so, Mallory, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. I believe, I believe that, Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Son of the living God and, I accept him and I accept Him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Mallory, upon your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, <laughs> resurrection. On the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Peter stood and he preached a sermon he did not write. The Holy Spirit moved him to tell the story of Jesus. Today you've heard the story of Jesus. On that day, people cried out in one voice, what must we do? Peter's answer by the same Holy Spirit was repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Today, the message of Christ is the same message. Come, receive this calling of God to the children of God. Through faith, we receive. Through faith, Mallory receives. Through faith, 168 people so far this year have received this gift in obedience to the call of God. 168 people. And God continues to move. He continues to move. And there's a sense of urgency in our hearts. So I'm going to send you out today challenging you to be one of those four people that tears off the roof of houses to put those people in your life into contact with God. First, you must acknowledge Him yourself. You must see Him for who He is in your own life. And after you do, you've got to introduce somebody else to Him and Him to them. It is our calling as the church to reveal, to reveal 
God to the world. Father, today we worship you. You, your son Jesus. We worship you. You are our God. Our mind cannot fathom all that who you are. But we understand that no mortal man will stand before your throne. Only the children of God will stand in your presence in eternity. And Father, that's why you came. To open our eyes that we might see that through faith in Christ the Son, we can have life in his name. Now, Lord, send us out with this message of good news in Jesus' name. Name him. Thank you for being here today. And I accept him. And I accept him. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Natalie, upon your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, 